Marcella Otalera was born and raised in Colombia and now lives in Boulder, Colorado. She has an MA in Transpersonal Psychology and an MFA in Fine Arts. Again, that diffusion of psychedelic research out into the broader world. Marcella is an installation artist and has an innovative private psychotherapy practice in Boulder. For the first 15 years of her career as an artist, she taught at all levels and became specifically interested in the use of visual arts as a tool for working with trauma with at-risk at youth. The lives and experiences of the youth she worked with inspired her to pursue a graduate degree in psychology. She has dedicated her professional life to the investigation and research of trauma, specifically the use of MDMA for the treatment of PTSD. In her private practice, she incorporates somatic and visualization techniques to help process and integrate traumatic experiences. Marcella worked as a co-therapist in the first governmental-approved MDMA-assisted psychotherapy study in Spain and is currently principal investigator of the MAPS very important phase two MDMA-assisted psychotherapy study in Boulder, Colorado. So I turn you over to Marcella. Thank you. Thank you. I had a lot of suggestions of what to do to not be nervous. My very favorite one is imagine that this is my garden and you're all cabbage heads. <laughs> Lots of really nice cabbages out there. So this is one of my favorite quotes from a participant who really spent 25 years of her life thinking that she was bad. I used to say, I will be good over and over, but now I get to say, I am good. The incidence of PTSD is an estimated that 10% of the US population has it, and that it's higher with endemic arm, in countries with endemic ar armed conflict. And one in seven soldiers, and this is just the diagnosed cases, so we can all agree that it is really an epidemic and that it needs a lot more treatments available for it. PTSD is really about memory and about how memory is stored in the body. It happens when a person cannot move in, through, or out of a traumatic experience, and they feel trapped between feeling too much and feeling too little. They react to the present as a recurrence of the past. They feel fragmented and isolated, and the trauma often becomes the attachment and the identity. And this is just a few of the things that PTSD robs a person of. PTSD is sort of like the, the life experience is as though looking through a lens that shines only on the trauma. And so everything around it, society, family, nature, work, interests, any kind of connection becomes a trigger that always leads them to this shining spot where there's a lot of guilt and um, distrust in themselves and in others. They feel unworthy, suspicious, separate, completely isolated at times. Their bodies feel like it's a bomb, it's a ticking bomb. It doesn't really uh, respect them. They don't, um, they don't know when it's going to act out. Their sensations feel like landmines. It's unpredictable. And so they, they feel like this is it, this is life, this is the way they experience life. And the periphery is all in darkness and can trigger them to go back to this spotlight. One of our participants said, I am here because I am worn out. I want to work on my disaster thinking. It doesn't matter what I think about, it can be a tomato it always ends in a disaster trauma. Existing treatments of PTSD are effective 25 to 30% of the time, and they have a high relapse rate. And treatment sometimes can aggravate symptoms instead of making them better. It's expensive, 
and frequently it takes years and years of therapy to get even just to manage symptoms and long-term drug therapy as well. So why MDMA? There's a lot of anecdotal reports prior to criminalization that suggest that MDMA was very effective as an adjunct to psychotherapy in, uh, on many levels for many conditions. MDMA has been researched extensively. There are over 3,500 Medline uh, articles and MAPS has reviewed every single one of them. In criminal trials, uh, sorry, in clinical trials, phase one and phase two studies, over 790 participants have, have had um, no significant harmful effects or drug dependency. So it's really research and it's really, um, we need more research to find out more about the risks of MDMA, but it is, uh, we're pretty, in, in clinical trials anyway, we're pretty sure that um, we, have, we haven't found any of these um, adverse events. We're offering something that is really brief therapy. Three to five months is very brief for somebody who has PTSD, especially chronic treatment-resistant PTSD. And we're offering also a medicine that they only take two to three times. So the difference is huge in terms of what is available and what this treatment offers. And MDMA is not ecstasy. It'd be great if it were, because it seems like ecstasy is really, um, they don't know what they're getting, and oftentimes sometimes people can get worse. The MDMA that MAPS uses for clinical trials is uncontaminated and administered in control settings always. We have had really promising results using MDMA for, the chron for treatment resistant chronic PTSD. In both South Carolina and Switzerland, studies have been finished. So in, this is a, a slide of um, the study in South Carolina that was finished about four years ago, four and a half years ago. Um, baseline, this is based on the CAPS, and the CAPS is from zero to 136, so the higher, the more chronic, more symptoms, the average of the CAPS was 80. After the study ended, it came down, as you can see, and the long-term follow-up stayed down with the exemption uh, Lene talked about this morning of two, there were two uh, relapse participants and they both had permission to do one session and that seemed to be enough. So this is four years later. So let me talk a little bit about the Boulder Phase two intern study. Um, we're still investigating safety and efficacy and treatment modalities, what would be better? How do we really, even though we do have a manual, it's sort of like an ongoing manual and it's open. We, um, we're trying to figure out what is the best way to do this treatment and are there several ways to do it and not just one? And dose response is another one that we're also investigating. So we work with chronic, chronic treatment resistant. Um, in the Boulder study, there's 12 participants that can be enrolled and at this time, and three of them are currently enrolled, but we haven't finished with any of them, so I can't really tell you um, much about the results of this study, but we have three participants enrolled, all females, and we have four participants in the screening process, two males, two females. We have over 150 people on the waiting list. When we started this, we kept, we kept wondering how we were going to advertise, if we were gonna advertise in, uh, through therapists in the community and, and psychiatrists or in the newspaper, and we never got that far because without advertisement, we kept getting calls of people that had read about it in the MAPS website, or uh, their therapist told them about it, their doctor told them about it, a friend told them. And so we have over 150 people waiting, and every week we get two or three calls of people wanting to be on the waiting list. So there's not a shortage of participants wanting to, wanting to be a part of this. And so the intern part, 
this is the, f the first time that we're going to try that we're trying this model and there's a couple of reasons it, it is cost effective these studies are very expensive so but but really there's a, an incredible opportunity for therapists who want to be MDMA psychotherapists to get training hands-on so the training that you can do um, because MDMA is illegal, you can't really have hands-on training. So this is an opportunity for people to really um, s sit with a participant and be part of this and be trained while doing it. And so it's one of the things that we're investigating. Does that still work? Do we still get as good results having an intern? And by an intern, I don't, I, I mean, the ones that we have are people who are therapists but have never done this kind of work before or are just out of school. Um, we were hoping that it could also be if they were in their last year of graduate school and they could do this as their internship. But it's difficult to do that because when we started, that's how it was. And, and I, I had some interns that were on their last year of school. They were going to do this as their internship. And it took three, two years, excuse me, two years for the approval process. So they already graduated <laughs> by the time the approval process came around. So it doesn't work that well in terms of that. This is our treatment room. And actually it looks pretty different now because um, our treatment room was completely destroyed during the Boulder flood that happened a few, a couple, a few weeks ago. And the good news is that it actually looks better. <laughs> a new couch. So um, I think set and setting is really, really important. It's important that the participant feels safe, that it's a place where, uh, where it's kind of enclosed, and it's a nice room, it's a nice atmosphere, the lighting is low. We have one, um, one therapist on one side and one on the other, so we always have a team of two, male and female therapists. And in this study, um, I have a co-therapist, and he and I are seeing the first two participants, and then he and I split, and I work with two different interns, and he works with one for the rest of, for uh, each four with four um, participants. The sessions are about eight uh, is an eight-hour session. It's not that the effects of MDMA last that long, but we want to really begin the integrative process when we are working with them. So those last two hours when the effects are all, have already worn off are really essential because there's still uh, a feeling of being open and integration can begin to happen. Music is a big part of it. I mean, think music sets the tone and we choose it carefully um, so that we have certain music at the beginning that is pretty mellow and then we have a little bit more activating music and we have really activating music and then calming music for the end. So it's a little bit like being a DJ. That, that was a part that I had a little bit of a hard time with because I don't know, I don't know music that well. So I had um, a few people helped me with that, which is another great part about the Boulder study, is that Boulder is pretty open to this kind of work. And I ended up having um, a lot of volunteers. So I have volunteers that help me set up the room, volunteers that work with the equipment, and volunteers that have helped me with music. And they're also night attendants. So the participant stays in the room overnight, and the night attendant stays in the office next door. And so they have somebody there with them, they bring them dinner, they eat dinner with them. They're not there to do therapy, but they're there as a support for them throughout the night. And the therapists are on call 24 seven. The way it looks in the treatment session is there's periods of inner focus and periods of talking. We had our first participant was, she, she was really nervous about inner focus. When we told her, you can't, you know, you're not gonna talk all the time. Sometimes we might ask you to go inside. And, and so in, one of the things that we look for in participants is that 
what kind of what kind of person are they with regards to their trauma? Do they talk a lot and that's the way they uh, kind of divert their experience and they just want to talk and talk and talk and that's the way they interrupt it? Or is it somebody that's really, really quiet and doesn't say much? And based on that, we either will encourage them to go in more or to talk more. And this particular participant talked a lot and so she was, she, she, said, I'm really nervous about the inner focus. And we said, you know, we'll guide you through it, we'll help you th with it, and, and if it's too hard, we won't, we won't have to do it as much. And so um, we asked her one time in the beginning, can, you know, let, this is a good time for you to maybe go inside. And then about 20 minutes later, she said, I kind of really like that. I think I'm going inside again. <laughs> so, this is our treatment process. Um, it's a slide that Lene showed this morning as well. The yellow symbolizes the actual experimental sessions with either MDMA or comparator. This is a double blind, so the therapist and the participant are blinded until the end of the second, a month after the second treatment session. A lot of people, uh, think that the experimental sessions are really the most important part. But, but that's not really true. Because sometimes, like, how does it differ from people having an experience on their own? And I've had in my practice, since people have gotten to know that I'm doing this kind of work, I, I get a lot of calls of people wanting to come and integrate an experience that they had on their own. And so I think sometimes what happens is that either the experience is great and really helped a lot and is sustained, so that's a possibility, but another possibility is that it's not sustained, they don't know what to do with it, they don't know what to do with the experience. And so if it's left untended, then it becomes kind of like what I call the trophy experience. You put it on your mantle and you had this experience, but you can't integrate it, you can't do anything with it. So these preparatory sessions are really important in terms of building the alliance, having the participant feel comfortable enough to be in the room with the two therapists. And it's not necessarily trusting, because many times uh, trust is one of the most difficult aspects of PTSD. They don't trust, and so they don't trust themselves and they don't trust others. So it's not really about trust, but it's about safety. As long as they know that it is really safe, we are going to be safe in this room, and so we plan on these preparatory sessions, especially with regards to touch. They, um, the three participants that we've had so far, and the ones I worked with in Spain as well, they all really wanted to talk about, when are you going to touch me? Are you going to touch me? Are you not going to touch me? Can I tell you when? And so we really work on that. How are you going to tell me when you want me to hold your hand? Because sometimes stop, they're talking about something completely different. It could be about their own process and it doesn't mean that they don't want you to hold them. So, so really preparing that, having a language that is about how do we communicate during the session and really easing some of their concerns. A lot of times they think, am I going to lose control and start like you know, taking my clothes off and running out of the room. Um, what am I going to do? And so it's really telling them this is, that's not going to happen. And we are here to actually hold a container for that. And then the integrative sessions are also crucial because, because of what I said earlier, is that whatever happens in the session then needs to be integrated. Uh, many times people have PTSD are identified with their trauma. And then if something happens during the session that they see a perspective and have an inkling of something else, just switching your identity doesn't work, right? It's scary. And so you need integrative sessions to begin to know how am I going to live in my life and take small steps so that I can get to a place where I can integrate 
what happened in the session. And then um, we unblinded after the first, uh, after the after the second treatment session one month later, and the participant can decide to go back and do three sessions if they got a comparative dose, or go on to their last session. In our study, we, have, we will have five participants that will get comparative dose, and seven that will get full dose. Yes. Oh, okay. The therapist's role is to stay out of the way, the therapist holds the container, MDMA is the support. Encourage the participant to stay with the moment. Really, it's about bringing what's out there, what's general, what's in the past, to the present moment. And to use reminders. Sometimes we use music as reminders if they think, if they feel like they're having a certain experience that they want to remember. We jot down the song that was playing then and copy it for them, and that's enough to take them back to that experience. Most PTSD experts agree that it is really necessary for a client to remain present with their experience without interrupting them so that they can really process the trauma. And that this is one of the most difficult things to do. One, because that's what really they've been defending against. And uh, two, because sometimes the, the trauma resides in non-conscious memory systems. And the way to do this is resourcing the client, which um, can take years if it ever happens. So sometimes in conventional therapy, it's really difficult to take a client to a place where they can be with their experience without interrupting it, without getting hyper aroused or dissociating from it. So how does MDMA work? Well, it gives you the ability to go directly to process instead of content. Trust becomes possible, attachment, to self, to others, to the world. There's an awareness of the present moment. Fear is tolerated and is not overwhelming. Empathy and connection are enhanced. These are all things that do not happen for them in their daily life. The capacity to risk emotional uncertainty, the fact that they can say, I let, I let go of control. Shame and guilt is greatly diminished, and the body becomes a part of instead of apart from the experience. So what happens when these conditions are present? And what changes? How do they affect the trauma? And so this is really my favorite part. <laughs> and uh, it is a very, uh, what I'm going to explain is a reconsolidation of memory from a totally non-scientific point of view. <laughs> So, the tra tr when, when an experience happens, the connections between groups of neurons changes, and that's how a memory is created. This is called consolidation. The memory, a memory cannot change unless it is brought to consciousness. So, when a memory is recalled, these connections become fragile and are susceptible to change. Memory is actually very malleable. If, we, if it didn't happen, if it wasn't possible, people would be in, in, incapable of changing. You wouldn't be able to change knowledge that is incorrect and improve it, or you couldn't improve an, a task, a new task. Like uh, I used to think the capital of Maine was uh, Portland, and now I know it's Augusta. So that's, I, it was, I was able to change that, even though I spent years thinking it was one way, I was able to change it. When a memory changes, this is called reconsolidation. And it can be positive or negative, depending on the conditions of when and how that memory is recalled. And this is really important because this is a place where, as therapists, sometimes we can create more harm and traumatize somebody who already has PTSD because maybe a, a therapist took the client to that place of experiencing the trauma too soon without them being resourced, or the therapist themselves felt like this is out of control and, and, the, and, the, part, and the client knows that. So then it gets reconsolidated in, in a more of like reinforcing, this is bad, this is bad, and I can't go there. MDMA strongly influences positive reconsolidation. Because MDMA, because of 
because of the hormones, secretion of hormones and neurotransmitters, it creates a state, uh, a positive state of interpersonal connection, less judgment, less shame, so the client has a greater capacity to stay with traumatic memories in a safe place. So if you, if you imagine that the bottom, the blue, is MDMA, MDMA is supporting, it actually is resourcing really fast. It resources the person, and it's about trust and empathy. They feel they're aware of the moment, they have connection, they surrender, they have a sense of well-being, and at the same time, they can experience the traumatic memory. And because of this blue, then they're able to stay with that traumatic memory without trying to interrupt it. They feel, the, they experience it completely in that moment, and then they realize, one, that they can handle it, that it didn't drive them crazy and go out of control. And then when that memory is stored again, it is reconsolidated with a greater access to awareness. And it is through awareness that change can happen. So, and this is also a time when then all of a sudden, then they realize that trauma was actually something in the past. And they're aware of the habits that they developed to protect them from experiencing the sensations and the feelings. And a habit is automatic and non-conscious and you can't change it unless it becomes conscious. So this is the beginning of being able to reconsolidate. You don't, um, the, the event memory doesn't change, but the habits and the conditioning around it can. And so reconsolidation happens with greater awareness of what they experienced in the session so that they can begin to then recall that when they're integrating and bringing it into their life. So this is a participant after she did this process. The why that feels like it would have the answer is what is keeping me locked up. I can see how I have made my own prison. I want to learn how to be in relationship with what I am feeling. The protector is what has gotten in the way of my process. So, when I was uh, my daughter's age, education about psychedelics was, was this. Oh, there is no sound. I can tell it. This is, this is your brain. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Lots of questions. Any questions. When I showed it to my daughter, she just went, what? <laughs> so education is still, we've come a long ways from that, from that commercial, but in some ways we're still there in, in, in a lot of ways, especially when it comes to educating young, the, uh, the young, people, young people today, because it's still based, unfortunately, on fear. So I imagine a world where fear is replaced by knowledge and curiosity and openness about the benefits and risks of psychedelics. And I think that it really feels, I see a lot of people in my practice with PTSD and it feels unethical not to be able to offer them this treatment. Because one, I know that it has great potential, that it has helped a lot of people, and so the thought that I can't offer it to somebody, that it could change their life, it could save their life, that seems to be very unethical. And hopefully, this is what will happen. We'll have MDMA as a prescription medication for the treatment of PTSD and hopefully other conditions, psychedelic therapy trainings, treatment centers, and that we can offer this as a modality that people can choose from. It's not gonna be for everyone, and it is not a magic bullet, but it is good to have it as, a, as an alternative. A couple of participant quotes. After all the holding I have done in my life, even the holding right now is being held by something bigger. It's like meeting God's vibration. How can I not take the gift of life as it was intended? This is about a participant who uh, felt like this was the end and all she 
wanted was to die. And this is what she said after her session. And as an artist, <laughs> this is my piece on reconsolidation. 3,000 moments of drinking tea, 3,000 tea bags, hand sewn to create a new memory. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Uh, have we any questions for Marcella? Miss. Yes. Um, after your wonderful description of how you would be able to treat people clinically and for a short period of time, I wonder how we could reconcile that to the pharmaceutical industry's need for profit. Wait. I, I, need, can I, I need it explained again. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. The, the acoustics in here are so terrible that we're going to ask people to say it again and speak very slowly. And also when I'm nervous, sometimes I don't understand questions. And sometimes when I'm nervous, I talk too fast. Um, I, I was just saying that uh, I really appreciated your description of a clinically use of, of the drug and how it will be able to help people. And this would mean that and also I understand that it would only happen a few times. It wouldn't like some, be something that somebody would take continually for the rest of their lives. And that sort of goes against what the pharmaceutical companies Absolutely. Have, have been doing with the drugs that are in use right now, is that it's given to a person and they have to take it for the rest of their lives, no matter what it does to their body, with liver problems, uh, diabetes, weight gain. Um, right. So I'm just wondering how we can reconcile that to the industry's need for profit. Well, I think that's why um, the insurance companies won't look at it. You know, there is no profit uh, for them with MDMA because we are saying, taking it two or three times, and so um, they're not going to be the ones. There is no money in it for them. Another question? Yes, thank you uh, for speaking. Uh, you mentioned that um, one of the ways that you think MDMA might be helpful is that it goes directly to or gets a client to go to the process. I was wondering if you could maybe say a few more words about that. Okay, so, so because, because there is more trust and less shame and connection, then it facilitates, it, it allows for the client to not stay in content, to not just talk about it and not feel it in their body. So MDMA helps participants be able to be in their body where trauma actually resides and be able to describe, and sometimes for the first time, like a new language of how it's affecting them inside. What does it feel like? What are the sensations like? Which um, many, many people with PTSD would not be able to tell you what sensations are because they're defended against them. And so for the first time, they're able to really feel what it is like to be in their bodies. So we had, um, for instance, one of the participants, she spent a lot of time with, with her hands and it was like the first time that she was able to process what that meant for her, what, how her hands had been involved in her trauma and that she had not been able to make that connection. Other questions? Hi. Hi. Thank you for your work. Um, <clears throat> so did you find that um, a lot of uh, a lot of your patients really um, worried, like their first concern was um, the effect of interfocus, like the idea that that's gonna be like a big thing. Is that like the number one struggle? You know what I mean? That they were gonna have to focus on things that... I think the number one struggle is, is um, the feeling that they're gonna be out of control because they have spent their life their life in PTSD, in the time that they have PTSD, trying to control the world so that they don't have 
those sensations and those feelings. And they've made their world oftentimes small, so they can control it. And this is where isolation happens and lack of connection. And so the thought of not having control and allowing the experience to unfold and the uncertainty of what can happen in that moment is, is really big. Sir. Thank you very much. How is the training for the psychologist different when using MDMA as a tool? How, how, how would we train people? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so the training would involve watching some of the videos. So we videotape all the sessions, preparatory, integrative, and treatment sessions. And these are um, videotaped for rating purposes. Um, to find out how we're doing, you know, we, we have as our model, even though we have a manual, we do have a, a, as part of that ma manual an open um, interpretation of like everybody is going to be different and we all come from different modalities. So of course we're going to bring that into the session as well. And so, so part of the training will involve watching videos seeing, oh, here was a great moment, here was maybe, whoops, I wish that wasn't on video, <laughs> and um, I have an excuse, we had a flood. So, um, so it would be, you know, that would be part of it, that would be most of it, and just really, right now we have a five-day training, so my team had five-day training, and I continue to train the interns with watching as, we're, as we go, watching those videos, watching those tapes, being able to learn from them, and being able to see how we can do it better or what really works and how, you know, what was great about it. Other questions? Coming? Okay, stand up, please. Talk slowly. I will. Um, I have two questions. The first is, um, how can a friend of mine get on the waiting list? <laughs> how can what? A friend. How can someone get on the waiting list for the oh, trial? Oh, okay. So, that's a really good question. And you can talk to me about that afterwards, because I'd be glad. I, I have a... Um, I have a coordinator, a study coordinator, and so I, when any of us get people who are interested, we give it to her, and she calls and gets the information to put people on the waiting list. So I'd be glad to give you that information. I should have written it down here, but... No, that's a, thank you. The other question is, uh, symptomatically, how can you differentiate between depression and PTSD? Mm -hmm. um, a, lot of, a lot of people with PTSD have depression. It's definitely one of the symptoms. And, but, not, but it's not the other way around. Everybody that has depression doesn't have PTSD. So uh, we, we differentiated by doing the CAPS, the, the clinically administered PTSD scale. Um, they have to have a 50 on the CAP scale, which constitutes chronic. So they have to have at least a 50 on it. We also do the SCID, which tests for other things, including depression and um, other, other conditions. But the CAPS is mostly what determines then uh, whether they can participate in the study or not. A lot of times um, attachment is a big one that looks very similar to PTSD, and so that's one that can get differentiated once, we take, once they do the CAPS. Another question? Hi, I've got two questions. The first is, um, aside from PTSD, what other mental uh, illnesses, mental health diagnoses, um, seem promising for the application of MDMA? Um, the other one is, uh, when screening people for participation in these studies, um, what would you consider to be a contraindication um, for participation? What would, in other words, what would make someone not a good candidate for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy? Okay. I'm trying to remember the first one. What was the first um, one? Other applications of MDMA. Oh. Yes. Um, 
Well, uh, in terms of anecdotal information, we have a lot of, um, before it was criminalized, that people worked with it for anxiety, depression, um, couples therapy, they worked a lot with it. And, and I think also conditions like OCD is something that um, we have had studies with other medicines for OCD as well, but um, OCD is, is an, uh, another big one. I think uh, Lene talked about the autism study coming up, so lots of conditions, I think, will be able to be help, helpful with MDMA. And then um, we exclude um, borderline, bipolar one, schizophrenia, any kind of personality disorders, so it's not to say that they're not going to be help, that, that doesn't help people who have these disorders, but it, in terms of the clinical setting that we have, um, we would have to probably have a different kind of setting and a different kind of protocol really for, for that, so that's why we are excluding them, not necessarily because they wouldn't get helped. Another question right here. Hey. Um, Oftentimes with the MDMA experience, people can experience um, feelings of safety and love. And when that experience wears down, those feelings can oftentimes go away. And so I was wondering what your experience has been with your clients if they have had a hard time integrating back and what the follow-up process is from like the days to come afterwards so that they continue to bask in that safety and that love that they experience throughout the treatment. Well, I think that one of the beauties of MDMA is that you're able to recall those experiences that happened during the session, those moments of feeling love, of feeling compassion, of feeling empathy, that they don't just go away and, and that you're able to really bring them back and recall them, which is part of integration, which I, why I think integration is so important. And so that is when we can do, um, sometimes we have people say, can you write this down? Can you write this down? I don't want to forget. And so we write it down. Sometimes a symbol, um, something that they do with their hand. Okay, when I do this, I'm going to recall this experience in this moment. A piece of music that is playing at the time. And so part of integration is about, is about really how to take the steps to then make those experiences a part of their lives so that they know it did happen, I did have that experience of feeling of well-being, and I can have it again. And so it's sort of like a beginning. That's why I think MDMA is not a magic bullet. It, there is a lot of work that happens afterwards, but it opens the door for that process to begin, and it gives people a different perspective to really hold on to and say, this is what is possible now. Do we have another question? Sir. I was just curious about the resourcing process and ways that you actively foster that. How, how do we foster the resourcing? Uh, do you actively foster it or is it just sort of a byproduct of the oh. MDMA experience? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the biggest differences between MDMA assisted psychotherapy and other modalities is that it really takes a long time to resource somebody who has PTSD and to really get them to a place where they can tolerate that wave of experience. And with MDMA, it happens really fast because those conditions really help it. And so then it is we do in the preparatory sessions ask them what kind of resourcing they do, what helps them, and then we also give them other suggestions for that, that we have, things that we know have worked for other people. So we start there, but during the session, it happens almost automatically. We have a question over here, young lady. Excuse me. Um, yeah, I was just wondering how the music was chosen and like based on what individual characteristics of like, is it based on their particular trauma or like what, what ways are that, that you choose the music that you would use? Oh, the, the music? We choose it mostly in terms of uh, that we, we know 
that a lot of people experience the same thing in terms of first when it's first coming on the feelings that are coming on and so it's it's sort of like a soothing place and so the music is very soothing we choose music that don't have any words english words uh, so that they don't have that connection and it's mostly that and it's mostly the experience and then the music then then we choose when they're really when there's a time of a lot of activation a lot going on then the music is a lot more powerful powerful to kind of support that and we do have participants sometimes say "Ooh, I don't like that and then we change it and then it's like they intuitively know oh that feels good that music is really really good and soothing and and that you know and then we keep that please uh, help me thank uh, Marcella Otalaro. thank you <laughs> thank you very much <laughs>